Carry On Camping was produced in 1968. It took the campness of the carry-ons to a new height. While Sid James represented the heterosexual side of carry-on, three of the male leads were homosexual. Frankie Howard, Kenneth Williams and Charles Hawtrey. These actors brought to their roles a level of campness new to British cinema audiences at that time. Bursting to know what it's like inside a tent. I see. All right, Miss Dobbin, I'll attend to this customer. Oh, thank you, sir. Splendid girl, and so helpful. Do you know she's been showing me how to stick the pole up? Camp isn't the word for him. I don't know what it is. He's just from a strange, etiolated, uh, epicene quality that is um, was remarkable and very funny. The great thing about Charles Hawtrey was, he was Campus Christmas. He was a mummy's boy with a capital mummy, but he was very different to Kenneth Williams. Kenneth Williams was obviously an academic, obviously wanted to work with the greats and had, was somehow slumming it. Giving it his all, but slumming it. Charles Hawtrey is an icon of British comedy, worked with Will Hay, been in films throughout the 30s and 40s and 50s, and was still somebody, huge face, who insisted on travelling everywhere by public transport. And you knew that this was a man whose bum was happiest on a bus. Charles, um, a difficult figure because um, seemed seemed quite unfriendly towards people. He had, he, I mean, people liked him and respected him as a career. He worked with Groucho Marx and Will Hay and Max Miller and George Formby and all these greats of comedy. But come the carry on, he, he had a bit of a drink problem or, or a lot of a drink problem, um, and he couldn't really control it towards the end. He was he was in them a long time. He was in them from fifty eight to seventy two, but towards the sort of late sixties, he was he was drinking a lot, and, and Peter Rogers and Gerald Thomas couldn't really cope with him. I mean, he came in drunk and. He couldn't remember his lines, and he was, it was uh, too much. And at the end of the day, the star of the film, as Peter Rogers would tell you, is that, you know, the carry-on title, whoever you are, whether you're Sid James, Kenneth Williams, or Charles Hawtrey, you know, you're not bigger than carry-on. By the late 1960s, Charles Hawtrey's drinking was out of control and caused difficulties on the carry-on set. In his last performance in Carry On Abroad, Hawtrey played a camp, mother-dominated alcoholic. Scriptwriter Talbot Rothwell was deliberately satirising Hawtrey's increasingly sad life. In 1972, Hawtrey was sacked from the Carry On team because of his drinking. He took semi retirement in Deal, a fishing town on the Kent coast, where he lived a lonely and shambolic life. Although a celebrated Carry On star, he became notorious with the locals because of his alcoholism. Sometimes um, we used to get um, a call from his house and he'd give us a little list saying what drinks he'd like delivered there. It was normally uh, bottles of sherry or uh, gin, sometimes some mixers. So I got the impression it wasn't just for him but maybe he was having people down as well. But I don't remember ever having actually picked anyone else up from his house apart from himself. He was very unpredictable even before probably the drink and um, I think I, I, I think his family had a, a long history of senile dementia as well, which people say in later years in life sort of affected him greatly as well, you know, combined with the drink. He's a very lonely man. Very, very lonely man. Uh, I didn't know him when his mother was still alive, but uh, apparently he missed her a great deal. And when he'd had a few drinks, if you were sharing uh, digs with him where his bedroom would be next to yours, you would hear him at night talking to his mother. Away from the carry-on films, Hawtrey found work in theatre, where his heavy drinking continued. I met a man who'd worked with him on pantomime, and he says that um, to me that they would lock they would lock Charles Hawtrey up the police because he'd be uh, after the performance he'd get so drunk that he'd uh, go off and cause abuse to everybody. They'd lock him up in the cells, and the company manager would have to come and fetch him the next day to go to the performance, and uh, he would wander on in that performance and, and not know what he was doing, what scene he was in, and, and they would gently guide him by the arm and take him off again. It's sad, really, because apparently there would be a great uh, round of applause and cheers when he walked on, but by the end of his first scene, people would be talking among themselves. It would be so awful. We were playing a town hall in Telford, quite a big one, 800 seats, pantomime. And uh, he'd found a pub in the town in the morning that served cheap doubles. And I'd gone looking for him before the matinee because it was an unusual matinee. It started at half past one instead of half past two, and I thought he might have forgotten. And I found him in this pub. 
He said, dear boy, wonderful to find you. It's also cheap in here, I'm on doubles. I'll be back in a moment, I'm just going to the loo. So I said to the barman, how many has he had? He said, five. I said, what, five large gins? He said, no, five large gin and its. I said, what, one measure of each? No, he said, a double measure of each. <laughs> I mean, the, the fact was that he was good. He was good copy. You know, he was. He, he would stagger down to Deal High Street, half cut, and you know, and and, and swear at the, at the taxi drivers and, and smash windows in pubs and things. And unfortunately, you know, that sells papers. Well, I've been in his company in Deal, where I went in a pub one day, and um, it was full of. Um, now, what do they call them? Marine bandsmen, I think. That was hilarious to begin with, but uh, after about an hour or two, I, I disappeared and went to another pub and left him there with these bandsmen. He was chatting the whole lot up, and it got very embarrassing. I'd rather gather the following day, the landlord asked him never to go in his pub again. <laughs> he did have a great love of, of, of young men, and I think he had various partners throughout his life, for maybe a month or two at a time, who knows, because he was a very private man, and uh, I don't think many people got close to that side of, of him, outside of his immediate circle. Everybody knew he was gay, but you never really saw anybody with him. He would like to talk in gay company, but you never see him wandering off with anybody. Probably was too drunk at the end of the evening to walk off with anyone anyway.